Greetings everyone, I'm Sam and we're here to talk about the depiction of state power in Arcane. We're going to be spoiling quite a bit about Arcane and discussing topics of violence, racism, sexism and general nastiness. And obviously because we're talking about several plot points in Arcane, here is your formal spoiler warning. So first of all, what the hell is the state? Well, dearest viewer, the state is defined by German sociologist Max Weber is the body that maintains a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. But what does that even mean? The body is the government and its constituent parts. Monopoly means it's the only one who gets to have the thing and legitimate violence means violence deemed okay by the state, usually pertaining to policing and the military. With the state covered, let's move on to Arcane. I'm not gonna give a detailed summary of it because odds are you've already watched it. And if you haven't, you should. What I'll give you is a quick rundown. Vi and Powder are two orphans of a failed revolution. After a robbery gone wrong, they set off a major police action between the wealthy upper city, Piltover, and the poorer, polluted, neglected lower city, Zorn. In Piltover, a young scientist, Jace, unlocks the secrets of combining magic and technology. He will be aided by Victor on one side and Mel on the other. From there we witness Zorn, now run by Silco, slowly prepare for a second revolutionary war and Piltover figure out what to do with its newfound power in Hextac. Throughout this show we get very heavy-handed thoughts on class strife, liberation, accepting others for who they are and not what you want them to be, and for us, power and authority. The show starts on the bridge that joins the two sections of the city in the aftermath of what appears to be a riot. The Undercity, led by a man named Vander, have attempted to cross en masse to demand independence and have been violently put down. We see an enforcer, a member of the state police, shoot an incapacitated person in cold blood. We also see two young girls, Vi and Powder, trying to find their parents. After that, they seek Vander, who has just beaten up an enforcer, and upon seeing the scared children and no one else, retreats with them to safety. On the other side of the bridge, the enforcers walk away. This is the so-called legitimate violence. If the state is threatened, it allows itself to use whatever violence it deems acceptable to maintain its hold over power. The police can execute civilians in the name of maintaining order, but the public cannot fight back at all and will be punished for doing so. That's why it's okay for police to fire tear gas into a crowd of protesters, but if those protesters throw that gas bomb back, it's considered assault with a deadly weapon. In Arcane, this is shown through the idea that the Undercity is just naturally more dangerous and its inhabitants more prone to crime. For too long has the Underground been left unchecked. We've lost touch. They may not be your preferred constituents, but they're still our people. The Undercity cannot be controlled. Not by us. So where does that leave us? Mr. Talos, could the trenchers build a weapon with the stolen crystal? Shimmer. Body replacements? We've seen their ingenuity over the years, of course they can! Through this, the police brutality is seen as justifiable. In the real world, we get racism, homophobia and classism to justify over policing. Now, the police can be held accountable if they are seen to cross some line of acceptable conduct, but this is a negotiation by the state. If enough of the public disapprove of policing tactics, there is a risk they will question the legitimacy of the police and possibly the government itself. This leads to some code of conduct, but it's often minimal as possible, and oftentimes the state and police will just be more covert about its violence and try to excuse it. Later on the episode, Vi, Powder and their adoptive brothers sneak up to Piltover. They talk of how much Piltover has compared to the Undercity and the unfairness of it. Come take a look. Oh. It's nice getting above it all, huh? Animals. As such, they decide to rob an apartment and discover some magical gems, one of which explodes and causes a fair bit of damage. <laughs> 
This rattles the upper classes who demand the council do something, even when the enforcers insist it's a waste of time because they'll never find the perpetrators. This mention of magic has the people afraid. The culprits must be apprehended. We're doing our best, Counselor, I assure you. Your attitude makes me question if your best is up to the task. Oh, we'll find them. Don't worry. We've conducted exhaustive interrogations, frozen commerce for half the district. With all due respect, Counselor, don't you think we've pushed them hard enough? Do whatever it takes. Turn the undercity upside down if you have to. Just find them. Punishing the actual criminals isn't the point, though. The council simply wants to put on a show of force. They have been challenged by this crime and now they have to flex their power to keep everyone believing in them. The council draws its powers from the support of the aristocracy and so must make shows to appease them. In the real world, this is why the police will help the upper and middle classes with almost any problem, but generally ignore the working classes except for the most major crimes, because they have a lot less political influence. I'd like to take a minute to focus on something Arcane does here. Has the head of the enforcers, Grayson, be a fairly idealised cop? She doesn't want to use excessive force and generally tries to be reasonable in letting the Undercity police itself. You know this crossed the line upstairs. Was anyone hurt? A building was blown to bits. What do you think? Those who did this will be dealt with. That workshop belonged to the Kermans. You know what kind of stuff they had in there? Makes this place look like a candy shop. The council needs someone to make an example of. People need to feel safe. Yeah, topside people. We had a deal, Panda. You keep your people off my street, but I stay out of your business. Give me a name. We'll do things quiet. No one will know you were involved. I can't do that. You don't seem to grasp how serious this is. If I don't put someone behind bars tonight, the next time I come down here, I'll have an army of enforcers with me. We both know how that'll go. I'm sorry, Grayson, but I can't offer up my own people. But her hand is forced by the council's pressure. This is a good showing that while there can exist police who are good, the system they are part of is simply a tool to control and when push comes to shove, they will have to be the subjugators or quit. Later we will have Caitlin, an enforcer from a noble family who has a disdain for the dishonest politicking of Piltover and an urge to see the real world, but still harbours a contempt and distrust for Zornites. <laughs> In what mad world would I trust someone like you? Someone like me? You enforcers are all the same, just asshole criminals in fancy uniforms. You know what? Find Silco yourself. I will, thank you. <laughs> Undercity's gonna eat you alive. Police are products of their environments, and many honestly believe the bigoted ideologies that are used to justify their roles. Being a fantasy show, Kate will somewhat overcome this, but we'll get there. Now let's go back to the robbery. The girls find technology and magical gems that are clearly dangerous. Having those must be illegal, right? There's a lot of restricted items here, and I don't see any permits. You want to tell me how you got them? They're the results of illegal research by Jace, and the show makes it clear that were he not a patron of a council member's family... We've known Jace for years. Besides, we're his patrons. If anyone is meant to speak up for him, it's us and a friend to yet another council member. Do that and I theorize you'll get away with, um, how do you say, uh, slap on the wrist. He would be exiled from the city. However, because of those relationships and his research appearing profitable, the council greatly lessens his punishment. A violation of the ethos calls for banishment. But I can sympathize with a young man's dream to change the world. Perhaps in this matter, a lesser sentence may suffice. For a real-world example, we can look at our dearly beloved Elon Musk. He conducts rocket launches near a small Texan town despite local objections and damage to the wildlife, and breaking agreements with the local authorities. He can get away with this due to his wealth and status where other folks would not. Turning a blind eye or favouritism isn't the only way the wealthier elite gets an easier time with the law, though. Fixed fines mean certain laws are essentially optional for rich people, and being members of the prevailing ethnic group and well-off is linked with less severe punishments than if one was an ethnic minority or poor. 
The state essentially allows the wealthy to exist outside of certain legal limits in exchange for their support. Listen, here's the thing. I don't know what you kids are up to, but I do know one thing. Laws are threats made by the dominant socioeconomic ethnic group in a given nation. It's just a promise of violence that's enacted and police are basically an occupying army. You know what I mean? You guys want to make some bacon? He pulls a mask over his face, pulls a lit Molotov cocktail out of his mailbag, and whew. Now you might ask yourself, either regarding arcane or the real world, why is the state so focused on keeping the working class and the oppressed groups down rather than lifting them up? And it's a simple case of holding power. There is a real fear that everyone filling their prescribed role is the only thing keeping us from complete and total, not the fun kind, of anarchy. There is honor in being in your place and doing your best with it. Most especially if your place isn't at the very bottom. The thing about hierarchies is they're self-similar on many scales. If you're in the middle, then you serve the king, Valar de Hyrus. But to everyone beneath you, you are the king. You've got a good job and a good wage, that gives you some power over people who don't. And getting pissed at those above implies that those below have a right to be pissed at you. So long as you have a system of those who have and those who have not, it'll be a requirement that you keep the have-nots from gaining power so they can enact change that will favour them while potentially removing power and wealth from those who already have it. Other ways you might see this manifest is heavy policing of protests that challenge the established power system. Movements like Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion and even Gay Pride often see heavy police presence that is often ready to kick off into violence. Get back! Tell me where I can find them. Top side of business ain't my concern. It's every one of you trenches concerned now. Give me a name. Hey guys, you should see this. Social change or threats to the current economic powerhouses like oil companies will generally be faced with heavy scrutiny from the state, which has a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Within the story we now get a fair bit of drama and juicy stuff I'm mostly going to skip over. In the Undercity, Vander gives himself up to the Enforcers to protect Vine Powder, only to be captured by Silco. When the kids try and rescue him, things go... badly? Up top in Piltover, Jace is joined by Victor and Mel to develop and advocate his hack stack, and our boy is quickly thrust into high office with a bit of manipulation from Mel. Tired of mingling? Mm. These people have nothing new to offer me. The only one actually worth my time is him. The golden boy. <laughs> He's one Piltover's heart. You see, Mel has an interest in hex tech for its political power. By having Jace on side, she can be a power broker between him and powerful members of society, ultimately enriching herself. Councillor Talus is willing to reinstate former trade privileges to those who share his vision. Can we count you amongst them? Councillor Balbach seems to think other arrangements would be more profitable. Well, the man's a fool. With him, you'd be investing in the past. With us, you'd be investing in the future. You know, Councillor Madara's right. The hex gates are only the beginning. In fact, we're currently looking for new partners in our hex tech research. And as a supporter of House Talus, you'd be the first in line to any of our advancements. In the real world, this is where you'll see lots of mingling between industry and politics. Industry generates wealth that goes into supporting political parties, and those parties then go to advocate for the businesses in whatever way they can. So let's move on to one of the trickiest points. Earlier I mentioned that one of the reasons Jace was given lighter punishment for developing dangerous technology known as Hextag was that it was seen as a potentially profitable system. States love wealth, 
especially capitalist states where money brings a vast amount of power. The ability to enact changes the ruler's desire requires spending resources and thus anything that helps gain those resources is something the state will want to encourage. With Hextech, the council can do far more trade, build unique machines and generally boost its production by absurd amounts. It's akin to the Industrial Revolution, which the forces of production have been centralised to a very small group of people. To keep economic power focused on benefiting the in-group, we developed capitalism in which wealthy people put their resources into businesses and then, because they were the ones who paid for it, control access to the means of production and get to keep the vast majority of the profits made. I'm not going to get too much into this, but I'll make sure to say that while there are far better alternatives to capitalism, it is currently the prevailing economic system and what nearly all real-world states will put a lot of effort into upholding. As such, a small group, in cooperation with the state, can hold power over the whole population. Getting fully into the machinations of capitalism is way beyond the scope of this video, but take away that it's very good at generating wealth which the state uses to enact its plans and to maintain its other systems of control. For a solid if intense explainer, check out this video by Unlearning Economics. Now let's get back to Vi, who we last left getting taken away by an Enforcer. After a time skip and yet another explosive robbery, Enforcer Caitlin is covertly investigating Silco's drug trade. One of her few witnesses is beaten up in prison and she wants to know why. This eventually brings her into contact with Vi, who busted up the guy for his links to Silco. Here Kate and Vi go on an odd couple investigation through the Undercity, as Kate pursues her investigation and Vi hopes to track down Powder, now going by the name Jinx. After many little adventures and lots of bonding, Vi and Kate decide to inform the Council of the incoming conflict in the hopes of dismantling Silco's regime. After the Council essentially shrugs its shoulders, Jason and Vi launch an assault on Silco, more of that sweet legitimate violence, but hit a snag when Jace accidentally kills a child. Vi tells him that this is reality of their city, and Jace sees how messed up that is. This will eventually lead Jace to acknowledge that while Piltover could easily crush Zorn in an armed conflict, the cost would be unjustifiable. So he convinces the council to grant Zorn independence. This was the last way the state holds power though, consent. Now since it's backed up by the threat of violence, we obviously can't call this real consent, but when enough of the public withdraw that consent, then the state's ability to govern disappears. A state only has whatever power it can hold by force, or with the people's permission. So now we understand the most basic ways the state holds power, we should ask, how do they get that power in the first place? The simple fact is, a faction managed to grab hold of enough resources to command power over a local population, and then slowly expand through military conquest, or the political consolidation of power through allegiances and marriage. You know, that fun Game of Thrones stuff. Ding dong, it's the outside world, and they have technology from the future, like really good metal and crazy rice farms. Now you can make a lot of rice really, really quickly. That means if you own the farm, you own a lot of food, which is something everybody needs to survive. So that makes you king. However, that doesn't help justify why the current rulers have power, so we have to make up a fun little story to explain that. The founding myth is vital to any state. In Piltover we learn that the most prosperous traders and merchants used their resources to declare themselves noble houses, and the most powerful were appointed to the council. All nations have these kinds of stories and romanticised histories that explain why those who rule rule, and why we should all love that. Historically, we can see this with the Roman myth of Romulus and Remus, and how the Senate justified its power through claims of lineage to the original founding families of Rome. We can also see it with the Nazis' pseudo-scientific ideas on race and the vilification of the Jews. We can also see this in the wonderfully tangled knot of lineage that is the royal lines of succession in Europe. These myths and stories help interweave the powers that be with national identity, so questioning one means questioning the other, which people are generally disinclined to do. No one wants to be disloyal to their own team, after all. So, via violence, economics and myth, that's how the state holds on to power. If you're a fan of the show, then you know there's a massive aspect of the story I'm leaving out, which is Silco and the Nation of Zorn. His and Powder's stories entwine as he escorts her down the path of becoming Jinx, the embodiment of the idealised nation, free-willed and self-sufficient. 
There's a lot to this part of the story, but I'd like to discuss it in a separate piece on the subject of revolution. And with that, I have been Sam. This concludes my weird little essay into how the state holds power. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.